Hi guys, thanks for listening. Thank you as well to those of you who donate to the Patreon account. I've launched a campaign to raise funds to buy a new iMac. My current computer has been in use for over eight years, and it is affecting my ability to create new content. As previously stated, my Patreon account can be found at www.patreon, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash leader one, L-E-A-D-E-R-O-N-E. For those of you who would prefer to make a one-time single donation, there is also the option to send money to my PayPal account. The email address to send it to is Morgan Rector, my last name spelled R-E-C-T-O-R, 331, Morgan Rector 331 at hotmail.com. Remember, any amount is fine. If one dollar one time is all you wish to donate, it would be gratefully accepted. Thank you for all your support, whatever forms it has taken. Enjoy the show. Welcome to Human Monsters. This is the first installment of a new series called Women Who Kill. In this episode, I profile Australian murderer Catherine Knight. Catherine Mary Knight was born on October 24, 1955, in Tenterfield, New South Wales, Australia. She grew up in Aberdeen. Her parents were Jack and Barbara Ruffin. The domestic environment of her childhood was aberrant and dysfunctional. Catherine was the product of an affair Barbara had with Ken Knight, who was Jack's friend and co-worker. The town they lived in was very conservative, and the affair became a major scandal. The shame and condemnation directed at the family from the community became more than they could bear. They moved to a town called Moray. Jack and Barbara had four sons. The two eldest lived with Jack, while the younger boys were raised by their aunt in Sydney. Barbara went on to have four more children with Ken. They had twin girls. Catherine was one of the twins. Ken was not as abusive with Catherine as he was with the other kids. He would lash her with an extension cord if she was out of sorts, but she was more compliant with than the others. If he was disappointed in her conduct, she would change her behavior to please him. While he felt little more than contempt for his wife, Catherine was his treasure. She was a typical little girl, playing with dolls and worshipping her father. He adored her and the unconditional love she offered to him. Catherine and her sister held aloof from their mother for the most part. Eventually, Catherine usurped what remained of Barbara's alpha status in the household. She cooked, cleaned, and even did some sewing as needed. She was displacing her mother in the home, as she had already done in her father's heart. Eventually, the mother-daughter dynamic fell away, and Barbara related to Catherine less like a daughter and more like a sister. Ken was highly abusive to Barbara. He used physical abuse and intimidation to rape her, often up to ten times a day. Barbara frequently regaled her daughters with intricate details of her sex life. She told the girls that she hated both men and sex. Ironically, years later when Catherine complained to Barbara that one of her boyfriends wanted her to engage in a sex act in which she did not wish to participate, Barbara told her to, quote, put up with it and stop complaining. Jack died in 1959. The two boys who lived with him moved in with Barbara and Ken. The chemistry of this blended family did not prove to be missable. As if the stress of losing her father wasn't bad enough, 
The presence of her brothers infused the atmosphere of their household with added tension. The boys did not respect Barbara and conveyed that sentiment openly. They regarded her as a whore. This was born of the resentment they harbored toward her for abandoning them in Aberdeen. They appeared to be pleased by how poorly she was treated. It was also because Barbara wasn't respected by anybody else in the household. The lunatics controlled the asylum. Catherine's brothers were blacklisted from every youth-oriented social event in town. They saw females as playthings to be abused at their whim. After a few incidents of molestation, they were blackballed and ostracized by the community. Having been denied access to girls outside the home, their crowded domestic milieu was seen by them as providing its own carnal opportunities. Catherine's sister Joy was spared because she was a tomboy and thereby considered less attractive. Catherine was far more feminine, so they singled her out for sexual abuse. From the ages of 4 and 14, Catherine was sexually assaulted on a regular basis. Each incident was worse than the last. She was groomed at first with friendly casual touching, cuddling, and puppy love kisses. This graduated into games where the prizes were Catherine's clothing and dignity. Defeat in these contests was usually assured for Catherine. When the two younger boys entered puberty, they began to join in. Catherine became a plaything for juvenile rapists. Naturally, this became a stressful state of affairs for Catherine. One day, she went to her mother for advice about sexual matters. She said, What do you say if you don't want to do those things? Her mother's response could not have possibly been less appropriate. Just let them do what they want to you. It's easier that way. Catherine never disclosed to outsiders the tortures to which her brothers were subjecting her. Some have questioned the veracity of these claims, but psychiatrists who evaluated her did not consider her retelling of the incidents to be deceptive. Some of her relatives have gone on record stating that they believed her. Catherine sought solace from her domestic hell with her participation in her relationship with her uncle Oscar. He was a champion horseman and well known for his work in New South Wales. When he retired from racing, he set up a horse farm where he cared for horses that were retired, abandoned, abused, and injured. Catherine loved animals, and she was eager to assist Oscar in his work. He was the positive paternal figure she lacked for years. Unfortunately, Oscar had a history of depression and committed suicide in 1969. Oscar's stables were the only place on earth where she felt protected, valued, and safe. Now she didn't even have that, and the sexual abuse at home left her at a breaking point. She just could not take it anymore. During this period, one of her brothers tried to feel her up, as he had often done. His timing was way off. She punched him in the face so hard, she nearly broke his jaw. She threatened to castrate him if he ever molested her again. This was a pivotal moment in the life of Catherine Knight. She was stronger than she had ever been. Her brother told the other boys what happened. When they approached her about it, she was in a cheerful mood, so they dismissed what the fourth brother told them. They assumed it was a misunderstanding, since her historical response to the abuse was compliance. They were mistaken. Over the next few months, each one of them would get fresh with Catherine, and she would inflict painful injuries on them usually superficial stab wounds. When asked about them, they would say they had some kind of mishap in the kitchen. She gave one of them a black eye, which he blamed on roughhousing with his brothers. They could not bring themselves to admit that a girl had unleashed such fury. They were even more reluctant to confess to the behavior that set her off. 
Barbara's relations with her extended family had been alternately cool and troubled throughout the years. However, throughout a period when she communicated with them on a regular basis, those relationships were mended. She eventually decided it was safe to move back to Aberdeen. Enough time had elapsed for the locals to either forget that scandal had occurred, or it was simply old news. Either way, Catherine, her mother, and her siblings moved back to Aberdeen. Following the family's return to Aberdeen, Catherine experienced a considerable amount of bullying. She was not prepared to tolerate it, however. Whether the abuse was verbal or physical, she would dish out punches, kicks, and lashings of cutting remarks. Those just represented the most simplified of her tactics. A girl tried to trip her as she boarded the school bus. Catherine retaliated by cutting off the girl's ponytail with scissors. A boy who commented on her budding breasts had his teeth smashed into the back of the seat in front of him. These kinds of incidents were baked into her life as long as she attended school in Aberdeen, especially when she was on the school bus. She was confronted about it by teachers, but she was so polite, cheerful, and charming toward them that they could not do the math that added up to the battle axe on the bus. The silver lining was that Catherine's reputation as someone who was not to be fucked with became an insurance policy against the victimhood by which a pacifist would have been damaged. Her academic performance was stellar. She rose to the top of her class. Historically, Catherine's tendency toward violence was utilized in self-defense. However, she eventually elevated herself in the school's interpersonal hierarchy by abusing those at the lower echelons of the pecking order. She regularly terrorized the younger children. She carried a concealed knife and used it. She once cut a student who talked back to her. There was another occasion when she stabbed a young boy and left him bleeding on the floor. When confronted about these incidents, she was like the character Alex DeLarge in A Clockwork Orange, an innocent-seeming girl with a sunny disposition in the company of adults. She was solicitous enough toward adults that they could not believe that she was so dangerous. That all changed one day when she received a failing grade. The teacher could tell she was in a foul mood. He assumed she was menstruating. He tried to be understanding. He said to her, Kathy, you all right, love? She wouldn't look at him at first. Whatever the cause of her turmoil or frustration, she was so worked up she was fidgeting. The teacher said, Kathy, you weren't saying much today. Is something the matter? Finally, she looked at him. She snapped at him, saying, curtly, Is something the matter? What do you think? She threw some loose papers at his face. She went on, Is something the matter? You're meant to be on my side. You're meant to help me. Why'd you fail me, eh? You've been leading me along all this time, making me think you're on my side, when really you just want to spit on me, like those other pigs. She leapt from her seat. Anticipating an attack, he stepped backward. He put his hands up as his only available defense. He said to her, Calm down, Kathy. It is just one test. You'll have plenty of chances to make up for... Catherine said... Don't you tell me to calm down. You're just like the others. You never cared about me. The teacher was backing away. She advanced toward him. He said, Kathy, it was just one test. It doesn't matter. She said, You don't matter, you cunt-faced son of a whore. He was aware of Catherine's reputation with its history of violence. He never even considered that he would become one of the victims. He said, now steady on, you can't talk to me like that. She said, fuck you. She drew her arm back and he saw the first glimmer of her knife. He said, Kathy, no. She tried to stab him in his stomach. He sidestepped her. They engaged in a dance of death, her pursuing him across the classroom, 
keen to plunge her blade in his flesh. He backed into a desk. He ran out of space to flee. She slashed a superficial cut in his clothing. She made no contact with skin, but it was clear that she was not fucking around. He said, Kathy, stop! He tried to grab her wrist. She nearly sliced off his fingertips. She was possessed by homicidal rage. Her eyes were glazed over. This was a Catherine Knight to whom he had never been introduced. She was possessed. She was so consumed by rage, she was incognizant of the drool that was sliding off her lips. She couldn't even hear the things he was saying. It was as if she emerged from an alternate reality where the customs and morality of the real world were exotic or poorly understood. When a moment of clarity arrived, Catherine finally realized what she was doing. She would not have stopped slashing at him until he bled himself dry. Left with no other choice, the teacher took an opportunity to defend himself. He punched Catherine underneath her chin. He hit her so hard he pushed her off her feet. She fell on her back. It knocked the wind out of her. As soon as she gathered breath back into her lungs, she began to cry hysterically. Other staff came running to have a look at what the commotion was about. Despite nearly being murdered by her, the teacher was remorseful. He said to Catherine, Oh God, Kathy, I'm so sorry. Are you all right? He knelt beside her. The teacher was blamed for this incident. He was suspended. Catherine played the victim card effectively. However, after an investigation, the history of her violent behavior came to light. The teacher was reinstated, complete with an apologia and back pay. Catherine was suspended, but was allowed back with a proviso that she adhere to the conditions of her probationary period. She complied during the last month of that school year, but though she didn't lash out at anyone, including that teacher, it was obvious to everybody that the embers of her wrath were still burning. She dropped out of secondary school at the age of 15. Catherine Knight's mental instability was examined closely by mental health professionals. They felt she fit the criteria for borderline personality disorder. With this condition, the patient lacks the ability to regulate their moods and emotions. When they get angry, they are quite capable of being physically violent, with some even committing murder. The one wholeness argument was her choice to remain armed with a knife, even when she didn't anticipate a threat or a show of disrespect. Another thing that cast doubt on this diagnosis was that she didn't respond to pharmacological treatment. It was time for young Catherine to make herself useful. She had to get a job. A butcher at the Aberdeen Slaughterhouse. Her father had worked there and she wanted to follow in his footsteps. She had watched her father go to work on flesh with a highly skilled hand. She was mesmerized by it all. She approached the shift manager to ask for a job. She was willing to do anything. He told her it was not the kind of work that was suited to a woman. She was outraged, but with her father nearby, she decided to keep a lid on her anger. She was determined to live her life on the cutting edge, so to speak. With meat cutting severed as an option, she went to a clothing manufacturer. She already had years of experience as a seamstress. She had made most of her clothes. She became a model employee and earned enough money to move out of her parents' home and get her own apartment. She enjoyed the freedom that came along with this arrangement. Still, the rejection from the slaughterhouse was a wound that never completely healed. She would befriend the slaughterhouse workers, drinking with them after her shift ended. Catherine's reputation among the butchers wasn't strikingly different from that of her high school days. She was as violent and foul-mouthed as always. The man who turned her down for the job realized that she wasn't nearly as different from the men in the shop as he had previously assumed. Not only could she fight and curse with the best of them, but her work ethic, 
expertise with a knife, and ability to work with her hands, made its way to the management of a slaughterhouse. The married men were impressed. The single men didn't see what all the hype was about at first, but then they discovered her dexterity in the bedroom, and that perception changed. She was so aggressive in her pursuit of these men, they found it off-putting, and in some cases, intimidating. She applied for a job at the slaughterhouse. This time, they couldn't resist. In 1971, she retired from the garment industry. Catherine Knight the Butcher was officially born. Catherine was a natural in this line of work. She worked in several departments and excelled at every task. She was continually upgraded to new levels of responsibility. Such was the faith her employers had in her. She got to know every man she worked with on a personal level. Some of them were still not sold on the idea of a female butcher. When they offended her with sexist words or actions, she did not take it sitting down. The first time someone raised their voice to her, it set the agenda for her relations with male co-workers. She quietly and diplomatically suggested that they settle their disagreement with their, quote, fucking knives, end quote. Catherine Knight was more effective as a butcher than she ever would have been as a human resources manager. This was not the first time she suggested this method of conflict resolution. After a while, she could not count all the men among her friends, but even the ones who hated her did not cross her again. Eventually, her relations with the other men became more relaxed, and feeling more in sync with them, she would join in with their conversations. She could swear with the best of them. It was a man's world, but she proved that she could fight her way in and out of it. She earned their respect. She was promoted to the task that is considered to be the most complicated and rigorous of a butcher's work, deboning. Her father established himself based on his deboning work, and she dreamed of doing the same. She even worked alongside him when their shifts allowed it. She worked tirelessly to advance to this level. He wasn't exactly thrilled that a teenage girl demonstrated the potential to usurp him, but he kept it to himself. Ken drove himself to work harder than ever, and this just inspired Catherine to do the same. This was just fine by the owners of the business. In Catherine's presence, the men worked harder, faster, and with greater efficiency because they just could not allow themselves to be outdone by a girl. Her superiors felt she should be rewarded, though they didn't want to rile her co-workers with a raise or a promotion. She was given a token of their gratitude in the form of a set of personalized knives and a leather bag to carry them in. She used them at work every day. She sharpened them for ten minutes before every shift. She would display them on a hook above her bed as if they were a trophy. They became her prized possessions. After befriending men in all departments, she developed a particularly strong kinship with a man who worked in what was known as the pig room. The old man who slaughtered the pigs did it with gusto. The more humane method of slaughter was to hit them heavily on the head so that they would not be cognizant of their injuries. He was a sadist who enjoyed the torment he inflicted on the pigs. Catherine watched him in action, and she was fascinated. She once watched as he skinned a pig while it was still alive. This came to preoccupy her to the point that she no longer wished to remain a spectator. She shared this man's thirst for blood. She proved to delight in this ritual as much as the old man. She would chase a pig around, cutting it several times to make it suffer as much as possible. Catherine Knight took a shine to a worker named David Kellett. He wasn't a butcher. He drove for the company. The two were different in many ways. He was more passive. She was more physically imposing than him, muscular and six foot tall. He preferred to remain on peaceful terms with everyone and stay out of trouble as much as possible. One day at a pub, a miner made an insulting remark to David. Catherine's face turned red. 
This was the first sign of a coming storm as far as her capacity for untrammeled rage was concerned. She punched the miner repeatedly as hard as she could. By the time she was done hitting him, her knuckles were bleeding. Some of the man's teeth littered the floorboards. David pulled her off, fearing that she was going to kill him. He didn't fare well. Some of their co-workers had to add their own strength to the endeavor. Most of the patrons put it down to excessive alcohol intake. This was not so. She never drank alcohol, only lemonade. She saw how booze weakened others and impaired their judgment. She wasn't prepared to lower her guard for a second. Catherine and David were left with no other option for a watering hole, but they were not prepared to part ways just yet. They spent some quality time at a hotel. He couldn't help but feel moved by her overture. How many women would punch out a man to win the heart of another? They became an item. Catherine wasn't just his lover and bodyguard. After once subsisting on discarded scraps of meat and the slaughterhouse, Catherine served him meals fit for a king. She mended his clothing when needed, and she was a savage in the bedroom. He had never been with a tigress like Catherine Knight. Their sexual appetites were not commensurate. She never found satisfaction, but David was never disappointed. She wanted to convey to him that she was devoted, and she pulled out all the stops. No other woman had done so much to please him. He was also surprised by Catherine's tender side, which she concealed at the slaughterhouse. She was a keeper as far as he was concerned. They soon moved in together. The waters did not always run smooth. Catherine flirted with male staff at the slaughterhouse. The normally mild-mannered David was angered by this. The men's wives were also aware of the flirting, and they urged David to marry Catherine, feeling that a wedding band would strangle the coquettish side of Catherine Knight into the grave. Catherine had her own ideas about why David was dragging his feet when it came to marriage. She assumed his agenda was to use her for sex until the thrill was gone and then he would depart. This she could not abide. She began to subtly insinuate that a marriage proposal would not go amiss. When this didn't work, she demanded it. She insisted that he prove his love for her by tying the slip knot. David's reluctance to propose had more to do with his belief that Catherine wasn't interested. Now that he knew she was game, he made his move. He decided he could do a lot worse for a wife than Catherine Knight. When Catherine brought David to meet his parents, Barbara cornered David in the kitchen when he went in to collect beers for himself and Ken. She said to David, You want to marry her, do you? He nodded. She said, You sure about that? You know she's got a screw loose? David laughed nervously. He was astonished that her mother described her in those terms. He said, I know she's got a little temper, yeah. She said, Nah, you don't. Don't understand at all, do you? As David made his way slowly but irrevocably out of the kitchen, Barbara issued a warning. You'd better watch that one, or she'll fucking kill you. Stir her up the wrong way, or do the wrong thing, and you're fucked. Don't ever think of playing up on her. She'll fucking kill you. David chuckled a little. He said to Barbara, Don't you worry, I'll treat her well. Barbara said, I'm not worried. Ain't me she'll kill if it goes tits up. David was skeptical. He assumed Barbara was speaking hyperbolically. Their wedding was soaked in booze, with all attendees drinking heavily. Catherine's in-laws were insulting to her, but she didn't allow it to get to her on what she considered to be an otherwise perfect day. She was especially keen on consummating their union back at the apartment. She tore his clothes off as they made their way through the apartment. They forgot to lock the front door. They had sex three times. After the third time, he was exhausted. He passed out. 
Catherine wasn't finished. She was left alone in silence with her passion. David began to snore. Her lust boiled into rage. She slapped and punched him, but it was no use. He was so inebriated he couldn't be roused. She reached a boiling point. She got on top of him and wrapped her hands around his throat. She began to strangle him. She nearly killed him, but he woke before brain damage set in. He broke free from her grip. He staggered out of the room. He gasped air back into his lungs. David noticed several marks on his body. Scratches. Bruises. All he could remember was that they were having sex, and then he woke with her hands around his throat. He said, Kathy, what the hell? She advanced to him from the shadows. She kissed him and said, Thought you'd fallen asleep on me there. Ready to go again? David stepped backward. He said, You choked me? She said, What? Just a little. Don't be a pansy. You weren't waking up. She pushed her hands into his chest hair. He pulled away. He said, So you thought you'd just choke me, you mad bitch? She said, don't you talk to your wife like that, you ugly little bastard. You married me. That means you're mine. She pulled him closer. So you get your lazy, drunken arse back in their bedroom and fuck. You hear me? He grabbed her wrists and pried himself free. He said, You're nuts. You've got a screw loose. The old bag tried to warn me, but I didn't listen. Catherine was too distracted by the content of her own thoughts to keep track of what David was talking about. She said, Daddy did it five times. We've got to do it more. David said, What? What the hell are you talking about? Catherine said, On their wedding night, my daddy did it with Barb five times. You love me, don't you? You love me more than that, right? We've got to fuck again. Two more times. At least two more. We've got to. He was appalled by all this. He did not want her parents to be incorporated into their sex life in any way. Suddenly, Catherine snapped out of her delirium. She said, David, don't worry about all that. It is just a little fight. Everybody has a little fight once they're married. Come on now. Come back to bed. I'll kiss it all better. David said, all right, love, you head to bed. I'll just nip to the loo and meet you there, yeah? Catherine said, Don't be too long, or I'll start without you. The bathroom was the only door of the apartment's interior that had a lock. He locked the door and went to sleep in the bathtub. Just under ten minutes later, Catherine was pounding on the door. David was too drunk to care, and he went to sleep. The marriage evened out, with Catherine doing all she could to please David. The only time when her temper got the best of her, the only time when her temper got the best of her was when she suspected him of infidelity, which could be caused by anything, like him arriving so much as a minute late home from work. Once during her first pregnancy, David put on a new shirt before going out to the pub with his friends. She assumed he was getting dressed up for a rendezvous with a woman. As revenge, Catherine put all his other clothes in the bathtub, doused them with lighter fluid, and set them on fire. The fire exceeded her expectations. She was forced to flee the building so that the Aberdeen Fire Department could extinguish it. She brought shame upon them both, and they relocated. David stayed away from the pubs, fearing the humiliation of being questioned about the fire. At the new address, Catherine was even more paranoid about David's potential to be unfaithful than ever. One night she struck him in the face with a hot clothing iron. It burned him so deeply it nearly made contact with bone. He sought refuge in the bathroom, locking the door behind him. Catherine pounded the door with the iron, leaving burn marks in the wood. Without warning, her rage disappeared, and she apologized profusely. She vowed that she would never do it again, and that she only got upset because she missed him. He accepted her apology and the gauze she applied to his face. 
The scar she left behind would remain with him for the rest of his life. On another occasion, when he was three minutes late getting home, she assaulted him with a skillet so hard she knocked him out and he was seeing stars. His brain was swollen for a few days until the cracks in his skull began to close. He told police he was attacked by an intruder. Catherine pampered him with care and affection. He could not tell the truth about what happened because at the time, rural Australia was a place where gender roles were traditional and he would have been laughed out of town. Meanwhile, Catherine's superiors at the slaughterhouse put her on leave due to her burgeoning pregnancy. Being alone for days on end was not good for her mental health. It only gave her more time to stew over her suspicions that David was unfaithful. She would attempt to blow off steam by taking long drives in the countryside. She would swerve to hit cats, dogs, dingoes, kangaroos, koala bears, and other animals when they appeared. This was the only thing that amused her in those days. One night, David notified Catherine that he was attending a darts tournament at the pub. He got her approval and told her he would be at home at 11 p.m. David didn't arrive at 11 p.m. She decided that for a change, she would keep a lid on her temper. She called the pub and asked to speak with him. She said, I thought you were coming home. David said, I am, I am. The tourney is just running a bit long is all. Shouldn't be more than an hour. But you said you'd be back at 11. To save face in front of his friends, David said, well, now I'm saying I won't. When David did finally return home, he was ready for anything. Because of this, he was able to duck out of the way when she swung at him with a frying pan. She wasn't about to give up and David fled the apartment. He slept on a friend's couch. Catherine's fear of infidelity became a self-fulfilling prophecy. David became so estranged from Catherine due to her abusive behavior that he sought solace in the arms of another woman. He got the woman pregnant in the process. The day Catherine went into labor with her daughter, Melissa, David tendered his resignation at the slaughterhouse and got the fuck out of Dodge. Well, Aberdeen. He didn't look back. Catherine's ability to bond with her child was compromised by the rage she felt toward David for failing to appear and support her. She began to take out her anger on the baby, cursing and yelling at her whenever she fussed about something. She would bump the pram against the sides of buildings as she took her out for walks. At one point, police were called in to intervene. Several people observed Catherine's conduct and were concerned about the child's safety. When police approached her about the matter, she broke down into tears. She shifted all blame toward David for abandoning her and her daughter. She was taken to a hospital that was equipped with mental health professionals. What the staff found was that she may have been struggling with postpartum depression. They also found that she forgot how to read and write since dropping out of school. She underwent an IQ test. She scored in the low 80s. After evaluation, doctors diagnosed her with being possessed of a, quote, premeval intelligence, unquote, which was what one would have encountered in prehistoric humans. Neanderthal DNA may have been coursing through her veins. After all, her father raped and beat his wife for years, so her violent tendencies may have been hereditary. She was found to have psychopathy compounded with narcissism. What they also discovered was that Catherine was manipulating staff into believing that she was not culpable for her offenses. This was vintage Catherine Knight. She was discharged without facing any criminal charges. Circumstances at home were eerily quiet. Catherine wasn't screaming at her child whenever Melissa cried out to have her needs attended to. The neighbors were hypervigilant. Fearing whatever might come next, Catherine was widely feared. Everybody knew she was capable of anything, up to and including murder. Speaking of which, a homeless man known as Old Ted 
was walking along train tracks in search of mushrooms that grew alongside them. It would soon be time for him to step off the tracks as he felt the telltale vibrations under his feet of an approaching train. He heard the piercing wail of a baby nearby. It didn't come from a pram. It didn't come from within a house or apartment. He didn't see a mother nearby. He stumbled upon baby Melissa. She was laid out on the tracks. As the train drew near, her head began to shake in Congress with the rail. Old Ted picked her up and dashed from the tracks, effectively saving her from the train and the mother who left her in front of it. He found her just in time. The train nipped him so closely he could feel it on the back of his legs. Meanwhile, Catherine was on a rampage. She stormed through the streets in a rage. Her face flushed burgundy red. Everybody knew what this portended, and they got out of her way, though they had never seen her this angry. She was huffing and puffing. She was growling like a rabid wolf. She went to a general goods store and purchased a wood axe. She took to the streets with the axe in hand. The police were notified. It was no wonder Catherine Knight was dangerous with an axe in her hand on the best of her days. She was swinging the axe in a figure eight as she walked down the street. She was ready to kill anybody who fucked with her. Even the police didn't approach. After all, it is not illegal to possess an axe, and she hadn't actually committed a crime. They also knew that she could take on any man, especially with an axe. Suddenly, the cry of a baby cut into the atmosphere. Old Ted appeared with Melissa in his hands. When Catherine saw Melissa, she dropped the axe unwittingly. The police didn't know what she had in store for Melissa, so they moved in and restrained her. She cried out as she saw the baby in old Ted's arms. A gang of police had to pile on top of her to keep her subdued. She was taken back to hospital for more mental health treatment. Melissa was placed in Ken and Barbara's care. Catherine was forced to take medication in hopes that it would effectively regulate her moods. Catherine would not regain custody of Melissa until she was deemed well enough. The Macbeth family were well known to Catherine Knight and David Kellett. They helped David receive medical treatment after he was injured by Catherine. They were sympathetic to Catherine, given that she was a mother and wife abandoned and left to her own devices, limited as they were. Margaret Macbeth, 16 years old, heard a loud banging on her back door. It was Catherine Knight. She assumed it must be another emergency. Catherine was in tears. She said, My baby is sick and I don't have my car. I need to get to her. Will you take me? Please? Margaret said, of course, let me grab the keys and my brother. Catherine said, your brother? Margaret said, I'm babysitting him tonight. Don't worry, he'll come along with no trouble. Just head out to the car. I'll be with you in a second. As Margaret departed from her address, she said to Catherine, Where's your baby? At your parents? Catherine said, Queensland. We're going to Queensland. Margaret. What? That's a thousand miles away. What's your baby doing there? Catherine. Who gives a fuck about the baby? We're going to get David. His mom lives in Queensland. He'll be back on her apron strings. Him and his whore. They'll both be there with her. I'll see to them all. Margaret was trembling. She knew instinctively, given Catherine's reputation, that this was not an idle threat. She saw a butcher knife resting on Catherine's lap. Margaret. Kathy, I'm not sure I can drive you to Queensland. Is there somebody else who could... Catherine, shut up and drive. Margaret. I've got my little brother in the back. He's got school in the morning. I can't. Catherine took up the knife and cut a line across Margaret's cheek. It was deep enough that Margaret could taste blood. Margaret screamed. She was so disoriented by the attack, she swerved the car into the other lane. 
Catherine didn't let up. She said, just shut up and drive or I'll open you up. You hear me? Margaret couldn't speak. When she did, the wound spread open further and bled down her face. She swallowed torrents of plasma from the gaping gash. Margaret's little brother was screaming. Catherine turned back to him and screamed, Shut up! Shut up! To defuse the situation, Margaret shouted, All right, all right. I'll take you to Queensland, but we need to stop and get petrol, okay? We won't make it on an empty tank. Catherine didn't want to stop, but she also realized there was no way out of it, so she allowed this inconvenience. When Margaret went in the station to pay, she was in a panic. She said to the clerk, Please, you've got to help me. Me and my brother, we've been kidnapped. It's Catherine Knight. She's got a knife. She wants me to drive her to Queensland. She did this to my face. Please, call the police. Please. As Margaret waited for the police to come, her little brother made a move to escape. He was halfway out the door when Catherine grabbed his collar. He wriggled out of his shirt and landed on the ground. Catherine got out and pinned the boy to the ground. She placed the blade of her knife against his throat. She dragged him to his feet by his hair. She pierced him on his chest a couple of times. Blood trickled down his torso. Margaret witnessed this and nearly screamed. Catherine shouted at Margaret, Get over here and drive this car! Margaret shook her head. Catherine, you get over here or I'm going to gut him like a hog. You want to wear his guts? You want him dead? You're the one killing him, not me. Get over here, you little slut. Margaret began to cry. Catherine, you get in that car right this fucking minute or he's going to be squealing like a stuck pig, you hear me? I ain't going to kill him quick. It's going to hurt. You want to watch that? You want to hear that? Whimpering, Margaret squeezed out a negative. She took a step forward to the car, but the clerk grabbed her arm. He said to her, Don't do it. Margaret said, I've got to. You don't understand. He's my brother. I'm, I'm meant to be taking care of him. The clerk said, If you give her what she wants, she doesn't need him anymore. She'll kill him. You stay away or she'll kill him. The police pulled up. They knew they had to approach Catherine with caution. One of them said, Let's just put that knife down now, eh? We're all friends here, aren't we, Kath? Catherine said, Fuck you and the mother you rode in on. Police, no need for that now, Kath. It's all over now. Just you put that knife down and we can talk this through. No reason anyone needs to get in any trouble. Catherine, I'll slit his fucking throat. You take a step towards me and you're killing him. Police, nobody is going nowhere, Calf. We're just standing here on a fine summer's evening, having ourselves a conversation. Catherine wasn't smart enough to talk her way out of awkward situations. The blade of her knife was an extension of her tongue. Her words were printed in blood. She released the boy, kicking him toward the police. She said, lucky little bitch. One cop took hold of the boy while the other negotiated a safe space between Catherine Knight and other civilians. Catherine went toe to toe with the other cop. She cut some superficial slashes in his hands when he pushed them ahead of him in a defensive posture. She punched him in the jaw. She cut a long gash from his elbow to his wrist. He screamed. Catherine grinned. With the boy now locked safely in the police cruiser, the other officer snuck up on Catherine. She nearly stabbed him in the ribs. Both officers tried to subdue her. She never missed a trick, and she was laughing the entire time. They were outdone by this woman. The gas station clerk approached with two of his shop's brooms. The cops used the brooms to knock the knife out of Catherine's hands. They wrestled her to the ground, though it was no cakewalk. She screamed, clawed at them, and even bit them. She didn't go down easy, but they managed to cuff her. 
While she was restrained, she nearly broke one of their noses. Catherine was taken to Morissette Psychiatric Hospital. She was physically restrained until an effective treatment could be administered. There she remained for about a month. For the attending physicians, it was akin to defusing a bomb. She didn't make it easy for them. She became violent frequently, and they had to sedate her. It was the only recourse that got results. If she verbally abused them, they punished her in their customary way. Whatever form that took, she would rebel against it. She might spit her medication out of the staff that was giving it to her. On another occasion, she would tear her mattress to shreds. She eventually adapted to institutional life, but her tantrums and destructive behavior were well documented, and one slip-up could have extended her stay. She had a history of manipulation in the face of intransigent authority, and it was a game from which she consistently emerged as the victor. In the meantime, she received no support from visitors and family. Everybody knew she was sorely in need of psychiatric intervention, and they hoped it would put a cap on her aggressive behavior. Otherwise, nobody in her orbit was assured of their safety. She underwent intensive psychotherapy to get to the root of her troubles. She dominated the conversation, speaking at considerable length about how David ruined her entire life. She resented him and was hell-bent on revenge. She detailed her plan for vengeance and how she would execute her executions. She was methodical in her description. Step 1. Drive to Queensland. Step 2. Torture David's mother until she disclosed his new address. Step 3. Murder his mother. Step 4. Go to David's new address. Step 5. Kill any good Samaritans and bystanders that might get in her way. Step 6. Kill David. Step 7. Kill the woman she assumed David might be dating. Step 8. Return to Aberdeen. Step 9. Kill anyone who may have helped David escape. Normally, doctors adhere to a strict policy of confidentiality when it comes to the content of what a patient tells them. An exception is made when the patient notifies the doctor of plans they intend to initiate to harm themselves or others, up to and including homicide and suicide. The doctors inform the police of what Catherine Knight told them. They created a paper trail. They also contacted David in Queensland, informing him of the condition of Catherine's mental health and the plans she wished to carry out against him and his loved ones. David blamed himself. He felt that he drove Catherine to do what she had done by abandoning her at the time when she needed him most. He had done the same to another woman who bore his child. A wave of self-loathing engulfed him in despair. Determined to mend the situation as best he could, he returned to Aberdeen with his mother. He assumed he could reason with Catherine so that she could return to normal, whether that was possible or not. Having returned to Aberdeen, David applied to resume his work at the slaughterhouse. He was rehired. His next step was to appeal to the courts to have Catherine return to him in his care. He and his mother would be her caretakers. They would be required to ensure that Catherine take her medication and refrain from striking out at others in physical violence. August 9, 1976. Catherine was discharged in her husband's care. They drove to Ken and Barbara's house to pick up Melissa. David left Catherine and his mother in the car as he went inside to collect Melissa. Catherine's parents abandoned her during her stay in the hospital, and she did not handle abandonment well. Barbara answered the door. She grabbed him by the hair. She said, What did you do to my daughter, you cheating piece of sheep shit? David broke free from her grasp, his scalp scratched by her fingernails. He fell to the ground. She said, You destroyed my Katie. You drove her crazy. You just couldn't keep your dick in your trousers, could you? You had to ruin everything. 
she started stomping on him. Unbeknownst to Barbara, Catherine was approaching, and she was on the warpath. She punched Barbara under the chin so hard, her mother flew back at the doorstep. Catherine said, Don't you ever lay a hand on David again. He saved me. You left me to rot, and he came back for me. He's mine. Mine. You never even look at him again. Catherine stormed into the house, stalked through every room until she found her father holding Melissa. Without a word, she grabbed the child and left the house. Catherine and David relocated to Woodridge, a town where they were both unknown. It provided a fresh start. His mother lived with them and took up many household duties, including the upkeep of the home and child care. This freed Catherine up to look for a new job. Naturally, she sought a position with a slaughterhouse, and soon she was hired to work on the line at the Dinmore Meat Works in Ipswich. She fit in nicely and became an asset to the company, as she had with her previous employer. She would spend ten minutes sharpening her custom-made knives before every shift, as she always had. That level of commitment was rare among meat workers. She continued to take her medication as mandated. It brought her pace of work down somewhat, but that did not compromise the quality of her output. She was able to control her infamous temper. If somebody crossed her in the workplace, she was more likely to strike back with verbal abuse instead of with her blade. With her mother-in-law contributing and the money brought in through Catherine's efforts, there was little on the domestic front to complain about. Nevertheless, she was miserable. The fleeting moments of happiness she experienced came to her while she cut into the flesh of a freshly killed animal. That, or whenever she saw an animal on the road during her commute, she would swerve to hit it. March 6th, 1980. The second of Catherine and David's children, Natasha Marie Kellett, was born. This time around, David supported Catherine every step of the way. Catherine now resented her mother-in-law's presence in her home. She viewed her as more like an obstacle than a support system. Catherine was bored by her life, which became predictable and routine. Even her job brought her no satisfaction. She became distant with David to the point where she was very cold to him. She ignored his mother completely. Unable to live in this situation no further, Catherine decided to move back to Aberdeen. She packed her things, collected the children, and returned to her roots. David was relieved. During her first month in Aberdeen, Catherine and the children stayed with her parents. Shortly after divorcing David, she rented a house in Muzzlebrook. She was rehired by Aberdeen Meat Works. It was business as usual. A tragically pivotal moment in Catherine Knight's life occurred two years after her resettlement in Aberdeen. Overestimating her own strength, Catherine picked up an exceptionally large hog and injured her back. She was taken to hospital, but there was nothing the staff could do. To return to her position in the meat works would have meant that the heavy lifting would worsen her condition. She was forced into retirement. She lived on a disability pension and filed for workplace compensation. The government provided her with a housing commission apartment on the outskirts of Aberdeen. Her old life was as dead as the hog she was lifting when she injured her back. 1986. Catherine turned 31 and her life felt empty and grim. She mostly just had her parents and children for company, but that was hardly satisfactory. And despite warning her eldest daughter about the evils of men, she still felt lonely. At night, Catherine would assign babysitting duties to Melissa so she could go out to the bars. She was fortunate in that there were many men who did not know her and were therefore incognizant of her reputation. She met 38-year-old David Saunders, and he was very taken with her. Men who knew her history warned him about her, but he assumed they were jealous or speaking hyperbolically. He only knew the medicated Catherine Knight so none of that seemed possible. 
They would fight, and she constantly accused him of infidelity. She would throw him out of her flat on these occasions, and he simply went home. She would show up there a day or two later and apologize. Otherwise, everything was going well. On the one-year anniversary of their first meeting, David bought flowers for Catherine. When he arrived at her place, he found she was not in a festive mood. She was intense and irate. She was pacing back and forth. She took the flowers and tossed them aside without really looking at them. She slammed cupboards and chopped vegetables with aggression intermittently. David bought Catherine and the girls a dog. Natasha was especially taken with it, calling it the Dingo Pup. Catherine felt no affection for the dog whatsoever, even referring to it as David's dog, never accepting it as part of the family. David tried to talk Catherine out of her foul mood, sweet-talking and teasing her, but it did not accomplish his objective. Suddenly, Catherine ran out the back door, David followed her, puzzled as to what drew her attention outside all of a sudden. He heard a squealing sound outdoors. To David's horror, Catherine held the dog by the scruff of its neck, level to her eye line. She held a chopping knife in her other hand. She cut a slash in the dog's throat. Blood sprayed out. The dog was cut so deeply David could see its spine amid the blood and gore. The dog's cries turned to gurgling sounds. The sounds died out and it grew silent. Catherine dropped the dog on the ground. It was dead. She turned to David and said, If I ever catch you running around on me, that is what I'll do to you. David was deeply shocked, horrified. Catherine skillfully dropped the knife on the dog in such a way that when it landed, it stood straight up. David backed away. She followed him. He began to panic. When he entered the kitchen, he said, I'd never be unfaithful to you, Kath. You have to believe me. I've never even looked at another woman since you came along. Never. His words made no impact. She grabbed a frying pan and swung at him. He raised his arms to defend against it, but when she hit one of his arms, the bones were fractured. She battered him until he was curled up into the fetal position on the floor. She was screaming bloody murder as she bludgeoned him with the skillet. When she exhausted herself of energy, she dropped the pan and knelt beside him. She said, Why did you do it, David? Why would you do that to me and our family? Why? There was no point in asking at that juncture. She had rendered him unconscious. David spent the next week at his own apartment. He wouldn't answer the phone. He was determined to flush that psycho bitch out of his life. As a last resort, she ambushed him in front of his apartment's door. He was terrified by the sight of her. This was not the same Catherine Knight, however. She cried. She got down on her knees and begged for his forgiveness. Against his better judgment, he did. He believed people deserved second chances. So he brought her inside. They engaged in the madness and intensity of Catherine Knight's own brand of makeup sex. A new honeymoon phase had begun. That honeymoon phase resulted in a new pregnancy. David was looking forward to starting a family of his own, so much so that he moved out of his apartment and put down a deposit on a house. Catherine loved living in a home of her own. She decorated it enthusiastically. Her sensibility in interior decor would not have surprised anybody who knew her well. Animal pelts, taxidermy, skulls, rusted animal traps, leather jackets, machetes, rakes, boots, pitchforks, lots and lots and lots of knives. 1988. Catherine and David's daughter, Sarah, was born. 
Catherine fell into a pit of postpartum despair that was not unlike that which she experienced after giving birth to Melissa. 1989. Catherine and David's relationship had deteriorated rapidly. She seldom spoke to David by this point. It was this year when she finally received her workplace compensation money. She used it to pay off the rest of the mortgage and turfed David out. As she grew cold toward him, David became the one who was beset with anger. He was especially incensed that she was neglecting her domestic duties. It came to a head one day when he returned home from work to find that all his clothes were dirty. He summoned her and said, Will you do something about this? It's been sitting there all week whilst you've done nothing. Catherine left the room and returned with a pair of scissors. She proceeded to cut every article of clothing one by one. David attempted to save a pair of jeans, but just as he was reaching out for them, he became aware of a pain in his stomach. When he looked down, he saw the scissors sticking out of it. A pool of blood was spreading out from the wound. She twisted them as she pulled them out. David howled in pain. He went into shock. Catherine dropped the scissors and reached for her iron to finish him off. He denied her this opportunity by running out of the house and driving off in his car. Fortunately for David, the wound was superficial and did not make contact with internal organs. He rented a room in a town called Scone. He only returned to Aberdeen to file a leave of absence with his employer. His boss had heard all the Catherine Knight horror stories, so he was sympathetic. David returned to Aberdeen three months later to rescue his daughter from her mother. He even considered rescuing her other daughters. He didn't make it that far. He was pulled over by police. The day he left Catherine, she filed an apprehended violence order against him, which is similar to a restraining order. She accused him of domestic violence. He was given two options, leave or go to jail. Catherine had won. He had no way of seeing his daughter or the house. The blade of Catherine Knight had severed another man from her life. John Chillingworth returned to the life of Catherine Knight. They had been co-workers at the slaughterhouse. When he stopped at a bar, he found that Catherine was a patron. Before long, they flirted, and that led to sex at her place that evening. And onward it went. When Catherine went on a rampage provoked by delusions of infidelity, John fought back. The sex and rage cycle continued, and when Catherine became pregnant by him, it didn't let up. She was constantly accusing him of cheating, often on an hourly basis. He would often retreat back to his own apartment. Eventually, after she denied him sex, he began to take advantage of the opportunities that were offered to him by many of the town's women, who found him attractive. 1990. Catherine and John's son, Eric, was born. John was supportive on all fronts, and Catherine forgave him for being unfaithful. Catherine was tender and loving in a way she hadn't been in a long time. He began to feel guilty about cheating on her. He decided he owed it to her to confess. And so he did. Catherine didn't strike back at him directly, not at first. She went into the bathroom and punched the glass that contained his dentures. Somehow John didn't see how ominous this gesture was. He said, Oh, look what you've done now. I've only got the one pair I'm wearing to last me until I get those fixed. Catherine punched him in the mouth, damaging the real teeth he had left. He spat out blood and fragments of teeth. He went back to his own apartment and spent the night there. John returned the next day to collect his possessions. Catherine was lying on the bed, but at death's door. She had swallowed an overdose of sleeping pills. In a panic, he took her up and drove her to a hospital. There, her stomach was pumped, and she was brought back to life. Catherine was kept on suicide watch in a psychiatric hospital for a week. John watched the children and visited Catherine every day. He felt so guilty about driving her to a suicide attempt 
that he forgot the injury she inflicted on him. He apologized and she accepted. Still, she got her revenge. She would have men over and have sex in their bed, knowing full well he would arrive just in time to see it. The relationship was so toxic by this point that there was nothing left for him to do but leave. The last man John Chillingworth caught in bed with Catherine was John Price. Their affair had been ongoing for a year. He was well liked in the community and at work. He had a way of bringing out the best in Catherine, and that was no easy feat. When their relationship advanced from a purely carnal arrangement into something more meaningful, he was able to escort her to that new plateau without any of her infamous outbursts. They both had children, and things looked promising for the couple. It wasn't all roses, however. Catherine's old habit of accusing every one of her lovers of infidelity emerged. She screamed and cursed about it, though there was no physical violence this time around. Just because that side of her was dormant didn't mean it disappeared. The reddish hue that appeared on her face whenever she got angry had permanently colored her face like war paint. John accepted her tantrums because his last marriage had been an emotional wasteland, and he interpreted Catherine's anger as a manifestation of passion. He was warned by other men about the things she had done to her previous men, but he was an optimist and bought into her fictitious sob stories about what a victim she had always been. He also considered those men to be weak and therefore unworthy opponents of any woman. By the time 1993 came around, Catherine was no longer accusing John of cheating on her. Now she was demanding to know why he hadn't proposed marriage. The way he saw it, they had a happy and healthy relationship, and there was nothing about a government-issued document that would make it different, for better or worse. Catherine persisted, and while he did not grant her this wish, he did invite her and her children to move in with him in 1995. They entered a whole new honeymoon period. They were happy. The children were happy. The domestic tranquility didn't last long. She began to harass him about marrying her again. She would start these fights day in and day out. When John's employer decided to discard its used first aid kits, he decided to pilfer them and bring them home. After all, sharing a home with a woman like Catherine Knight necessitated the presence of gauze and other life-saving materials. One day while John was at work, Catherine took the video camera he bought her for Christmas and shot footage of all the kits. As she filmed, she provided a running commentary on all the things John stole from the company that employed him. She mailed the tape to his bosses. John was fired when management saw the tape. John went ballistic. When he arrived at his house, he took all of Catherine's belongings and tossed them out on the street. When Catherine arrived, she discovered that locks had been changed. They had a heated argument for two hours before she took her possessions and left. John was relieved, though it would not be easy to find another job. His association with Catherine tainted his reputation. Breaking from her tentacles would not be easy. He eventually found work at the slaughterhouse. One night when John went out drinking, he found Catherine in one of the bars. He had been thinking about the upside of their relationship, like the sex and the tenderness he enjoyed during their honeymoon period. They had sex later that night. Catherine expected him to invite her back into his house, but he wasn't keen on that idea at all. He wanted to at least insert a probationary period between that encounter and any renewal of their common law vows. John's friends were alarmed that he would actually consider getting back with the, quote, devil woman, unquote, as they called her. They gave him an ultimatum, break with her permanently or they would never speak to him again. He chose Catherine. His friends shunned him into social exile. 
Well, they didn't completely abandon the cause. When they heard David Kellett was back in town, they arranged for him to have a talk with John. He told him the story behind the scar on his cheek. He repeated the warning he received from others on his wedding day. If you cross her, she'll kill you. Do you understand? This isn't a joke. She will kill you. David's warnings did not make the intended impact. Catherine was on her best behavior during her campaign to regain her position in John's household. Eventually, this situation deteriorated and she began to harass him more and more about moving in. When she became especially hysterical and aggressive, he would throw her out on the street. Eventually, the arguments led to violence. When aggression didn't work, she would try to manipulate her way into the house with sweet talk and other forms of manipulation. But it never worked. He knew that letting her into his house was a compromise to his safety. As he put it one day, I ain't a fool, Kathy. I'm never letting you hold nothing over me again. Not ever. When you lose your temper, it doesn't matter what you've promised. Taking a cue from the Incredible Hulk, Catherine said, Temper? Temper? You've never seen me mad, John Price. You think you know fucking everything, don't you? But you know fuck all. You've never seen me angry. She launched across the room and slapped him until she exhausted herself of rage. He shielded himself with his arms. John suddenly became aware of something warm and wet on his chest. It was odd since she hadn't had time to fetch a cup of water. He looked down and discovered that a knife was protruding from his chest. She had plunged it so far in it nearly grazed his rib. He grabbed her by the scruff of her neck and threw her out the front door. He dropped to the floor. His breathing became labored. He pulled the knife out of the wound. It was no easy task considering he'd lost so much blood and was going into shock. He heard a thump against the back door, which was locked. The bitch was trying to get in. He was weakened, but he took a survey around the house to make sure there was no way for her to get back in. This was serious. He had to get rid of her or she was going to kill him. She had a key to his house, which exacerbated his anxiety. When he approached the Scone Magistrate's court to file a restraining order against her, they took one look at his knife wound, and they didn't hesitate. John went to work. The wound continued to bleed, and it left a patch of crimson on his shirt. When all his former friends in town found out about Catherine's attack, they realigned themselves with him, offering their support. To each one of these people, he said, If I don't show up for work tomorrow, it'll be because she killed me. They offered to let him sleep at their houses, but he didn't want to endanger his children's lives by leaving them at his place without his presence. When he returned home, he found that the children were sleeping over at a friend's place. This came as a relief to John. What he felt when he heard something pound the front door knob was entirely different. Mercifully, it was his neighbor checking in on him to make sure he was safe. Catherine made another video. This time she shot footage of John's children playing. She added a voiceover in which she talked about which of John's possessions should be bequeathed to each child in the event of his demise. Having finished this, she packed them up for a sleepover at a friend's house. Catherine went to John's house late at night. She dressed in lingerie, fully intending to seduce him in the most effective way she knew how. She caressed his body and removed his underpants. She got on top of him and rocked her hips. Driven by a maniacal desire, she grinded harder and harder until John woke. It was not at all what he anticipated at that time. He said, Kathy? She kissed him silent. They made out some more. He embraced her. Once John climaxed, he removed Catherine from his body. Bad move. 
this kind of rejection Catherine would not abide. She was tired of being thrown out, whether it was out of bed or out of the house. John was unaware of how she got a knife into her hand, though she did keep her prize collection in his house, above the bed. She cut straight through his chest into his lung, which collapsed. She took another swing, cutting into his liver. Panicking now, John jumped off the bed and ran to the bedroom door. Catherine cut him on his back twice as he did so. Blood sprayed from those wounds onto the carpet. Catherine ran after him, sometimes slipping on his blood. John was losing strength from the blood loss. He almost got to the front door, but he fell in the hallway. Immediately after he fell, Catherine mounted him and pounded her blade into his chest and stomach as she leaned her weight onto the knife. John somehow found it within him to throw her off. He reached for the door handle. He ran outside. He tried to yell for help, but he couldn't. There was no air in his lungs. He tried to crawl to the street, but she grabbed his ankle and dragged him back inside. Once inside, he lost all his strength and could not fight her off any longer. She stabbed him several times, and this was what finally killed him. Catherine took stock of the situation. She was covered in blood and gore, as if she had been working a shift at the slaughterhouse. She considered running away, but as she escaped from town, everybody would know she was the murderer. After returning from a trip to an ATM so she could withdraw all the money in his savings account, she took a look at John's corpse. The way she saw it, he had driven her to it. He fucked up a great thing. He should have loved her like she wanted, but he didn't. She spat on his face. She said, You, you did this. You did this to me. Her next move was to take her butchering knives and go to work on John Price's body, as if he were one of the hogs at the slaughterhouse. She cut off his head and threw it into an aluminum cooking pot on the stove. She poured in some water and threw in some cut vegetables. She activated the burner and stormed off. She fantasized about serving the flesh from John's body to his kids. She relished the possible reaction on their faces when informed about the source of the meat they were eating. She returned to John's body. She made one long cut along his pelt and went about the methodical business of stripping all the skin from his body. She hung his hide from the architrave of the door in the living room. In choosing the right cut for his children, she went with a rump roast, cutting both his buttocks off and then slicing them both in two. She put the meat in the oven to roast with some vegetables. She set the table for the kids. As the meat cooked, she went around the house smashing every picture of John and his kids she could find. To deflect blame, she wrote a note that would be left by John's body which would accuse him of having committed child molestation. The idea was that some fictitious vigilante would have committed the murder. This way everybody would see her as a hero instead of the psycho hose beast that she really was. She dished out helpings of John Price's flesh on his children's plates. She took a bite from the rump roast. She found it inedible and spat it out. She threw the rest of her portion out of the garden where the dog would have eaten it if she hadn't killed him. She realized the kids would not eat the meal. Desperate for a way out of this, she made a beeline for the sleeping pills she kept at John's house. She took an overdose and stretched out on the blood-soaked bed in John's bedroom. The next morning, one of John's co-workers was sent to his home to check on him. He saw a bloody handprint by the front door. A long trail of dried blood indicated that a body had been dragged indoors. He called the police. Catherine was found alive, though she was in a coma. When they found John Price's scattered remains throughout the house, they were so disturbed it turned many of them vegetarian for years. Others left the force. Some even committed suicide. They took the temperature of the broth in which John's boiled head was still stewing. 
This was the only way to determine an approximate time of death. John Price's cadaver was examined by a coroner. 37 stab wounds were documented. The incisions made along his body were so precise that the pathologist was able to sew John's skin back over his body. Catherine Knight woke two days later. Police questioned her almost immediately after. She claimed she had no memory of what happened the night of John's death. To draw away any suspicion of her culpability, she went on at length about how much she loved John. She was apparently trying to convince the police that she was either innocent or insane. Police questioned citizens of Aberdeen to ascertain if they had any insider knowledge about what had happened. What they got was a legion of character witnesses. Though they had not witnessed the murder, there was no doubt in their minds that Catherine Knight was the party responsible for the murder of John Price. They begged the police to lock her up and throw away the key because she was a bona fide menace to their society. It was due to Catherine's history in the community that it was difficult to find impartial jurors for the trial. The judge was relieved when Catherine entered a guilty plea. The stipulations of this plea were that she would admit to having committed manslaughter, a downgrade from a murder charge. The judge refused this plea. He was horrified by her offense, and he knew she should never be permitted to walk the streets of Aberdeen or elsewhere in Australia as a free woman. Catherine submitted a plea of not guilty, and a jury trial went forward. It was put on hold when Catherine underwent a psychological evaluation to determine if she were competent to submit the plea. Based on that testing, Catherine was officially diagnosed with borderline personality disorder. The following is a description of the disorder as detailed at mayoclinic.org. Overview. Borderline personality disorder is a mental health disorder that impacts the way you think and feel about yourself and others, causing problems functioning in everyday life. It includes self-image issues, difficulty managing emotions and behavior, and a pattern of unstable relationships. With borderline personality disorder, you have an intense fear of abandonment or instability and you may have difficulty tolerating being alone. Yet inappropriate anger, impulsiveness, and frequent mood swings may push others away, even though you want to have loving and lasting relationships. Borderline personality disorder usually begins by early adulthood. The condition seems to be worse in young adulthood and may gradually get better with age. Some mental health professionals who treated Catherine in the past emerged so that they could deny she had BPD. She insisted she experienced dissociation during the murder and therefore could not remember everything. Her lawyers laid out the case that she was not responsible for the murders based on this criteria. Her attorneys were very theatrical in their approach to selling this argument. Catherine employed some of her own theatrics by asking to be excused while the murder's grisliest details were being described. When the judge did not allow her to be excused, she threw a fit. It only ended when she was sedated. The jury didn't buy it. They found her guilty of premeditated murder, along with charges related to indignity of the corpse. The judge sentenced her to life in prison with the following addendum never to be released. She was the first woman in Australia's legal history to receive this designation. She launched an appeal in 2006, but it was denied. In prison, Catherine Knight enjoys a position of prestige. Everyone is aware of the madness and mayhem of which she is capable, and they give her a wide berth. She is a prolific artist, but not willing to sell any of the items to the kind of true crime enthusiasts who bought John Wayne Gacy's paintings. We may never see if her self-portraits are reflective of the monster that resides within. Thank you for listening to Human Monsters. Bye for now.